So just to start off and, you know, to give us some background, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about what we mean by the gut microbiome, right? And I'm sure all of you have heard this term because uh, we've, over the last decade or so, we've really come to understand that the gut and the bacteria and the microorganisms that live there might play an important role in MS. And so when we say the term gut microbiota, this refers to all the microbes. So these can be bacteria, archaea, viruses, and fungi that live in the gut. Uh, and when we use the term gut microbiome, that actually refers to the genetic material that's inside of these microbes that inhabit the gut. Uh, now, what's really uh, fascinating is the number of bacteria that are in your gut. And like the number of bacteria in your gut is about 10 times the number of cells in your whole body. And the genetic material is about 100 times of our own genetic material. Um, and it's the, you know, something that's really uh, interesting is that we've, in some ways, we've known about the gut microbiome for, or the microbiota for a long time. On the right is an image. Um, and this was drawn, uh, this is from a paper that was written by Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, uh, who is the inventor of the microscope. And this was published in the 17th century when he basically looked at bacteria that were present in the mouth. And so this is perhaps the first image of bacteria from the oral microbiota. And, but what has really changed over time is our understanding of what these microorganisms in our gut do. Next slide, please. And what we've understood and or has evolved over time is our understanding that these bacteria aren't just there, you know, for no reason. We now know that there's a highly regulated interaction between these microorganisms that are in your gut and our body. And these, uh, you know, can happen, uh, the, you know, the, the importance is for uh, in, uh, the immune system, for how uh, things are metabolized in our body, uh, even impacts on uh, things like our behavior. And it does look like, you know, my, both bacteria and humans have kind of co-evolved in terms of their interactions at the level of the gut microbiota over time. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Next slide, please. Kathy, next slide. Dr. Bargava, I think Kathy lost power. Um, uh -oh. So right. we are going to get your slides back up, but if you have your notes, you can continue and we'll get the slide deck back moving. All right, so my... All right, so I'm gonna keep going. The, so basically, you know, what would we have come to understand is that the gut microbiota have different uh, kind, different functions for our body. And these can basically be put into two buckets. One is their effects on the immune system and the other is their effects on metabolism, okay? And so when we talk about the immune system, uh, we have, all of us have immune cell collections within our gut. And the presence of bacteria in our gut is really important for the formation of these collections of immune cells. So which is called the gut, gut associated lymphoid tissue or GALT. And if you have mice that are grown in a bacteria free uh, environment, these gut lymphoid tissues don't form. And we've also come to understand that the gut bacteria help to educate or, you know, or an immune cells to become a certain way. Some bacteria can make immune cells inflammatory. Other bacteria make them anti-inflammatory or regulatory. And so there's kind of a really fine balance in how the bacteria in our gut can, 
you know, program our immune system. Now, besides their effects on the immune system, the other aspect in which, you know, they're really important is metabolism. And so, uh, again, here, there's two aspects to it. One is, you know, the metabolic effects they have uh, within the gut, and the other is beyond the gut itself. And so I'll give you a couple of examples. One example is that, you know, in our body, cholesterol that we eat in our food is converted by our liver into certain sub molecules called bile acids. And these are important because when they're secreted in the bile and go into your gut, they are then acted on by the gut bacteria and they are converted into slightly different forms of bile acids. Ultimately, they help us in absorbing fats from our food. So we don't have enough of these, we don't absorb fat from the food. And along with the fat, we also absorb things like fat soluble vitamins, like vitamin A, D, E, or K. And so the bacteria are really important for the, the metabolism of these molecules, right? And if you don't have the right bacteria, you don't have the right levels of these. Um, similarly, another important aspect of metabolism, which is impacted by bacteria is short chain fatty acid metabolism. So part of our food is, uh, is fiber, right? And fiber is something that our body cannot, uh, cannot digest on its own, right? And, but bacteria in your gut can break down this fiber and they can release short chain fatty acids from this. Um, for example, they're called acetic acid, propionic acid or butyric acid. And these are important because these short chain fatty acids are used by the cells that line your intestine, right, as energy sources. And if you don't have enough, then that impacts the health of these cells lining, the, um, lining your gut. Now, not only are these important there, both the short chain fatty acids and bile acids can then be absorbed into your blood and they can reach other parts of your body and they can have important effects on immune cells and even brain cells, um, in, you know, when once they're in the circulation. So the immune cells, um, so the gut microbiota have impacts, you know, both on immune cells, but because of how of their or their uh, contact with these immune cells in the gut wall, but can also have an impact uh, through the production of different metabolites. Uh, you know, that are derived from things that we eat and then can get into your bloodstream and impact cells in other parts of the body. All right, next, next slide. Next slide. All right, so we just talked about this. Next slide. And this is just a cartoon showing, for example, on the left, that there are some bacteria that make T cells, which are an important immune cell, in MS, some of them make those cells inflammatory. So Th1 or Th17 cells, which are inflammatory T cells, while other bacteria can turn them into regulatory T cells, which are anti-inflammatory. All right, next slide. Now, so, you know, this, so we talked about what the function of the gut microbiota is, but, you know, what happens in MS, right? And so many studies have now looked at what are the bacteria that are in the gut of people with MS and how is this different from people who don't have MS? And studies consistently show that people with MS have bacteria that are different for, from, compared to people that don't have MS, though which bacteria are different seems to vary from study to study. And this seems to depend on you know, where the study is done, whether it's done in the US or Japan, uh, and what the study population is, whether we're looking at relapsing disease or progressive disease, uh, and what medications the people might be on, right? And so, but some consistent results have emerged from all of these studies. So we find that some bacteria are higher in people with MS, certain bacteria are less abundant in people with MS. So for example, Acromancia or Acinetobacter is, you know, are found to be more abundant in people with MS. And Parabacteroides and Prevotella are less abundant in people with MS. And now, you know, what does this mean, right? Like, it's fine to know this. Now, some studies suggest that some of these bacteria might have direct effects on immune cells. So uh, some of them, you know, if we take Prevotella, for example, we put that 
in the animal model of MS, which is called EAE, and we give this to mice, it makes the EAE less severe. And it seems to act by directly contacting certain immune cells and turning them into less inflammatory cells, right? But another possibility is it might be an effect on metabolism. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I talked to you about how the gut microbiota plays a role in metabolism. Now we actually know that some of these metabolites are actually less abundant in people with MS. So for example, if you take short chain fatty acids and measure that in stool or in blood of people with MS and compare to that with people who don't have MS, those levels are lower in people with MS. Similarly, certain other metabolites like bile acids are also decreased in the blood of people with MS compared to uh, other people. Uh, and why, why, why might that be important? Because uh, some of these, for example, short chain fatty acids, even once they get in the blood, they can have an impact on immune cells and make them less inflammatory. Or bile acids, when they're in the blood, can get to immune cells or even to the brain and can make glial cells in the brain less inflammatory. So that's another way how the, the changes in the gut microbiota might impact uh, MS. All right, let's go to the next slide. Now, another question that you know uh, a lot of people have is about this phenomenon that you know called the leaky gut. Uh, and so, does this have any relevance to MS? Um, now, one of the functions of your gut, right, besides uh, digesting food, absorbing stuff from absorbing uh, nutrients from your food is to also provide a protective barrier, right? It provides a protective barrier against bacteria or products of your bacteria getting into your blood. And one way it does this is by specialized junctions called tight junctions that are found between these cells. So there have been a small number of studies in people with MS trying to study whether there is evidence of leaky gut. And some of these studies have shown higher blood levels of bacterial products like lipopolysaccharide. These are produced by certain bacteria and, and they can you know, cause inflammation. And then also higher levels of these proteins that are found in these tight junctions. And it's thought that these are representative of increased leakiness uh, of the gut. Now, whether it's the inflammation that's ongoing in MS, you know, immune cells, or the, when I say dysbiosis, it means the alterations in your gut microbiota. That is the reason for this leaky gut, we don't know. And whether this precedes, you know, somebody having MS, or it happens as a result of MS, that's something we still don't know. All right, next, next slide, please. So, you know, the next question that I, comes to mind is that if we know that the gut microbiome has lots of important functions, it's abnormal in MS, then you know, what can we do to change that, right? Like, can we fix it? So uh, there's basically, uh, you know, three strategies uh, that could potentially impact your gut microbiome. The first is what we call prebiotics or diet, right? So what you eat is basically what nourishes or provides, you know, sustenance to the bacteria in your gut. So if you eat things that support helpful bacteria, then perhaps that will suppress harmful bacteria. Another possibility is probiotics. So in here, the idea is just give more of what the, of good bacteria and that'll get rid of bad bacteria. And then the last is postbiotics. So I talked about metabolites, like say short chain fatty acids that are produced by the good bacteria. Why not just take the short chain fatty acid, right? To get around this problem of what's going on in the gut microbiome. Now, one other strategy I'll just briefly mention is something called fecal microbiota transplantation, where you try to, you know, kill off the bacteria that are in your gut and then replace it with bacteria from someone else who doesn't have MS. All right, next slide, please. So one thing that, you know, we've learned uh, and we've known for a while now is that the di is your diet has a major impact on the composition of your gut microbiota. So this was a study back in 2011 where they took people and they looked at the makeup of their gut microbiota and they saw that people basically fell into two buckets. Either you had more of one class of bacteria called bacteroides or you had more of another class called Prevotella. And when they looked, you know, what was different between these two groups, they found 
that your dietary composition, right, of what people ate uh, really strongly correlated with what, how, what your gut microbiome looked like. And even more convincing evidence was provided by another study. Let's move on to the next slide where they actually had people change their diet, right? And they had them change their diet to either predominantly plant-based diet, which is shown on the left, or an animal-based diet on the right. So obviously, if you're eating plant-based diet, you eat a lot more fiber. Animal-based diet, you have less fiber. Uh, you have a lot more protein in the animal-based diet and less in the plant-based diet. But what they found was that within a couple of days, you already started to see a difference in the composition of the gut microbiota. And so, it not only does long-term diet, you know, determine what your gut microbiota contains, but even, you know, short-term changes can alter your gut microbiota. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Now, you probably uh, heard a lot about diets uh, today in your earlier in earlier sessions, and you know, the bottom line is that there's still evolving evidence regarding you know, diets and its effects on MS. Uh, and some of these diets have been shown to impact things like weight loss, depression, fatigue, quality of life. But unfortunately, most of the studies have not systematically studied the effects on the gut microbiota. And so in one study where they were studying intermittent fasting, they did see that there were alterations in the gut microbiota. Um, another study looking at intermittent fasting found reductions in inflammatory T cells with, with fasting, but you know, better studies are required to understand what impact a specific diet has on the gut microbiota uh, and whether other prebiotics like you know, fiber supplementation might be beneficial in people in, or might have a beneficial in, impact on the gut microbiota in MS. All right, next slide, please. Now, moving on to the next category that I talked about, probiotics. So th this, there's an even smaller number of studies with probiotics in MS than there are with diet in MS. And most of these have been really short duration and very small sample sizes. So none of them have really shown any significant impacts on clinical outcomes. Uh, and the changes, metabolic changes that happen with these probiotic supplementation haven't really been systematically studied. Next slide, please. Now, the other thing, you know, when people, I mean, patients often ask me, um, what do I do? Like, you know, should, is there a probiotic that I can take? And what I tell them is, is this, that it's very hard to figure out at this point, what is an appropriate probiotic for MS? And there, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that, like I told you before, the studies of the gut microbiota have shown you know, varying results uh, and there are very few consistent changes across different sites and populations. And what's really unclear at this point is whether the changes that we see are a cause or a consequence, right? So I don't know if these changes happen, you know, prior to the disease and help the disease develop, or is this a compensation of the body, right, to the disease? And I will give you one example of this, uh, which, which is why, you know, this is so hard. So for example, Ackermansia is one bacteria which in several studies has been shown to be more abundant in people with MS. So the idea would be, Great, this is a bad bacteria. If we took, took this, put it in an animal model, it should make it worse, right? So when they took, when researchers took this and put it in the animal model, it actually made it better, right? And so that suggests that maybe this is not, you know, a causative change, but a compensatory change. So where this level goes up because it perhaps has a beneficial effect and maybe is curbing some of the inflammation that's happening in the disease. So this, this really makes it hard to identify, you know, what pro probiotic might be the best for, for people with MS. Let's move on to the next slide. The other thing that's really hard is to figure out, is your microbiome changing, right? Are your microbiota changing? And there was this really interesting study that was done about three years ago now, where they just took healthy controls and they 
gave these people, they basically sampled every the, the microbiota from every part of their gut. So their esophagus, their stomach, their small intestine, their different parts of the colon. And they then gave them probiotics and, and looked to see, did the bacteria change anywhere in the gut? And they found that the change really happened, changes in the microbiota happened only in about 30% of people. So in 70% of people, they could not change their microbiota at all. And the changes happened in different parts of the gut in different people. And what was really interesting was that if you just took a stool sample and looked at the microbiota, you couldn't really tell if the microbiota had changed or not. So that's, that's another challenge, right? Like we need to figure out better ways to tell us that if we give someone a probiotic, if we give someone a diet or a prebiotic, are we actually making the change that we want to see, right? And so, so you know, we and others are studying approaches like profiling metabolites in the blood to see if that could help monitor an intervention that targets our gut microbiota. All right, next slide. All right, and then the last strategy I'm gonna talk about um, and my last slide for today is postbiotics. And we, you know, I told you that postbiotics are basically the products of your bacteria, right? And so be beneficial molecules or, or compounds that are produced by the gut microbiota, we could potentially use those, right, as a treatment. Or, uh, and so one example of this is short chain fatty acids. So the, the propionic acid, which is one of these short chain fatty acids, when this was given to either healthy people or to people with MS, it actually resulted in increased numbers of circulating regulatory T cells or anti-inflammatory T cells. So this is one strategy that's being studied is to just basically give people short chain fatty acids and see if that will impact MS disease activity. Uh, another example is our secondary bile acids. So uh, I told you that the levels of bile acids in circulation are lower in people with MS. And we saw that, you know, if we gave this to, uh, in a mouse model, it actually made the disease less severe. So we're testing the, uh, the effect of supplementing this in people with progressive MS to see if that might be uh, a strategy that might be beneficial. 